Well, there are a whole range of, of, of things that urban heat can do. I mean, it, it can be important for infrastructure. So things like um, the power grid, uh, railway lines, uh, transport routes and so on, all of these things can be impacted quite severely by, by extreme heat. Uh, but probably the dominant uh, impact uh, is on human health because people are very uh, responsive in, a, in an unfortunate way to extreme heat, um, both in terms of uh, mortality and, and people becoming ill or morbidity. And so uh, there are some parts of the community that are more vulnerable to, to heat than others. Uh, so the very young and the very old. But the work that we've done in, uh, in Australia uh, also shows a, a whole range of different variables that are important uh, in terms of susceptibility. So age is one, but things like ethnicity uh, is another, socioeconomic status uh, and so on. So there are a whole range of things that make one group of individuals in a community more susceptible than another. And so the, the upshot of that is that there is a spatial uh, uh, variation to response to heat. Some parts of cities, uh, often the poorer, uh, less vegetated parts of the cities tend to have a much worse uh, heat health outcome than other parts of the city. We've uh, done some work in uh, different cities in Australia to look at the uh, heat mortality relationships. So that's been done for all of the major capital cities. Um, it varies, the, the actual response varies from one city to the other because of things like local adaptation. But broadly, all, all of the southern Australian cities tend to show a really strong response to heat alone, which is, is actually quite interesting because in many other parts of the world uh, there are a whole range of things that uh, cause a heat health response. So in southern Australian cities, uh, we find that there's a really strong um, uh, increase in mortality above clear temperature thresholds. And the, the best thresholds we find are an average of day and nighttime temperatures, because that kind of indicates uh, when uh, a hot day is followed by a hot night, then we find that we have a, a really poor response. So for example, in the city of Melbourne, uh, the, the threshold is about 30 degrees centigrade. And that's an average daily temperature, which is 40, a 40 degree day and a 20 degree night, for example. Above that, we find that the heat uh, health response changes markedly. And in fact, people die by uh, as much as uh, 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 the, the increase in death rate is as much as 17% above, above normal, above those. In the more uh, subtropical or tropical cities, I mean Brisbane and Darwin, uh, we find that uh, the humidity becomes more important. But certainly for the southern cities, uh, it's a, a, a direct heat health relationship, which makes it really quite easy to forecast. Basically, cities uh, have a climate that, as we talked about before, is warmer anyway. Um, under heat waves, uh, that uh, warmth actually is superimposed upon the regional heat that is usually related to what we call advection of heat out of the Australian desert. You know, so you get a, a in, the, in Perth, it's a strong uh, easterly or northeasterly of the desert. In Adelaide and Melbourne, it's more of a northerly. Uh, but, and, and so you find that during the day, at the time of peak temperatures, the urban heat island is, is probably, you probably don't see much of one. Where the heat island becomes much more important is overnight, because in those cities, in all Australian cities, the temperature does, does not drop off. So, uh, you might find that in the rural areas, uh, the temperature might drop off to 25 during a, a really hot spell. In the cities, it might stay above 30 degrees. So that, that urban heat is really, really quite significant in a, uh, a heat wave event.
There is urban warmth uh, in Perth, but work that we've done shows that the heat island effect uh, operates a little bit differently in Perth, and we're not 100% sure why that is. It might be related to the Fremantle Doctor, uh, that the, the cooling sea breeze that, that comes in. But, but certainly we find that um, in, for example, Adelaide and Melbourne, the, uh, the heat island is exacerbated, it becomes even worse uh, at night under extreme heat conditions. In Perth, it's actually the other way around. Um, but we all know that uh, there are differences in the way that heat events operate in, in these Australian cities. I mean, Perth has more uh, continuously hot weather. Uh, Melbourne is, is one of the most affected by extreme heat. Uh, Adelaide uh, took it back, although the western suburbs of Melbourne still have the highest temperature of about 48.5, I think it is, uh, recorded back in 2009. But central city temperatures uh, under those extreme heat conditions are sometimes a little bit lower than uh, some of the outer suburbs, particularly where there's a lack of water. So that's one of the other interesting things. Uh, so uh, the heat islands that we talk about are really most pronounced uh, at night. And often during the day and during extreme heat conditions, you might find that, uh, that they tend to drop out somewhat. Uh, because of the real, the strength of the advected heat coming in from, from wherever, from the desert or whatever. Uh, so what that means is that if, if the city is well watered, uh, you can often find that the central city, because of the shade of tall buildings and a bit of uh, watering going on, is cooler than some of the outer suburbs uh, in, uh, in those extreme heat daytime conditions. The heat vulnerability mapping that we've done uh, for all of the Australian capital cities is focused at night time. So uh, it does, that tends to show the urban warmth near the, toward the centre of the city. Um, but that heat vulnerability mapping is, is partly temperature, but there are uh, at least 10 other variables that are important in defining that vulnerability. And so things like uh, ethnicity, the amount of uh, vegetation cover, um, the number of aged care facilities in a particular postcode area, whole range of things that we know contribute to heat vulnerability. So, so those heat vulnerability maps don't necessarily always reflect where you might think it's hottest. To some extent they might, but not always. It, they reflect other things like the, the population vulnerability relating to socioeconomics, age and so on. Well, human thermal comfort uh, is partly a function of temperature, but it, uh, it is a construct, if you like, it's a, uh, a formula-driven uh, uh, thing uh, that relates a number of meteorological variables that we know are important for just how the human body is exchanging heat with the environment. So temperature is one of them. Uh, wind speed is another. Um, so if you've got a strong wind and the temperature is below the, uh, the body surface temperature, then it will take heat away from the body. You'll feel more pleasant. If that airflow is higher at a higher temperature and strong, then that will add to the body temperature. Humidity is, is important because that determines how much evaporation occurs from the, the surface of your, your skin. And that also de determines how comfortable you feel. But probably the most important determinant of human thermal comfort uh, is the radiant temperature. So, here we're standing out, out in the sun, so we're getting direct solar radiation. Um, and it's that radiation exchange between the body and the environment that is also important. So the best measures of human thermal comfort combine things like the radiant temperature, the air temperature, the wind speed, the humidity, uh, and so on. And it's for those reasons that we find that, for example, uh, shade is so very important for human thermal comfort. 
because the radiant temperature probably more than anything else determines uh, how comfortable you feel. So, so there's air temperature, uh, which is what the sensible heat of the air you measure with a thermometer. There's the surface temperature, uh, which, without going into the radiative terms, um, which are quite, quite complicated, but there's a surface temperature that uh, it determines the energy emitted from the surface. So air temperature and surface temperature are quite different, but they can be related. For example, if you've got a really high surface temperature, you're more likely to have, have something called convection, transferring that heat to the, uh, to the, uh, to the atmosphere. Um, the radiant temperature of the environment uh, is a function of the radiation coming from all of the surfaces around you. So it is related to surface temperature, but it's also related to the direct solar radiation from the sun. So the sun, the sun is contributing, so is radiation from all the surfaces around you. Um, and that, that radiation that is coming from those objects, from the sun and from the surfaces around you, is dependent on the surface temperature of the object emitting the energy uh, and something called the emissivity of the object emitting. So uh, the, the, the emissivity of the sun and most terrestrial objects is around one. So you have a pretty, pretty good em uh, emission. The sun is emitting at 6,000 Kelvin. The earth is emitting at something like 300 Kelvin. Uh, so uh, the, the energy emitted by earth and terrestrial objects is much, much lower. But it does contribute to the thermal comfort uh, in, on, on, of, of a body.